This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Frog Prince by the Brothers Grimm One fine evening, a young princess put on her bonnet and clogs and walked out to take a walk by herself in a wood. And when she came to a cool spring of water that rose in the midst of it, she sat herself down to rest a while. Now she had a golden ball in her hand, which was her favorite plaything, and she was always tossing it up into the air and catching it again as it fell. After a time, she threw it up so high that she missed catching it as it fell, and the ball bounded away and rolled along upon the ground, till at last it fell down into the spring. The princess looked into the spring after her ball, but it was very deep, so deep that she could not see the bottom of it. Then she began to bewail her loss and said, Alas, if I could only get my ball again, I would give all my fine clothes and jewels and everything that I have in the world. While she was speaking, a frog put its head out of the water and said, Princess, why do you weep so bitterly? Alas, said she, What can you do for me, you nasty frog? My golden ball has fallen into the spring. The frog said, I want not your pearls and jewels and fine clothes, but if you will love me and let me live with you and eat off your golden plate and sleep upon your bed, I will bring you your ball again. What nonsense, thought the princess. This silly frog is talking. He can never even get out of the spring to visit me, though he may be able to get my ball for me, and therefore I will tell him he shall have what he asks. So she said to the frog, Well, if you bring me my ball, I will do all you ask. Then the frog put his head down and dived deep under the water, and after a little while he came up again with the ball in his mouth and threw it on the edge of the spring. As soon as the young princess saw her ball, she ran to pick it up, and she was so overjoyed to have it in her hand again that she never thought of the frog, but ran home with it as fast as she could. The frog called after her, Stay, princess, and take me with you as you said. But she did not stop to hear a word. The next day, just as the princess had sat down to dinner, she heard a strange noise, tap, 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 as if something was coming up the marble staircase. And soon afterwards, there was a gentle knock at the door, and a little voice cried out and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. Then the princess ran to the door and opened it, and there she saw the frog, whom she had quite forgotten. At this sight, she was sadly frightened, and shutting the door as fast as she could, came back to her seat. The king, her father, seeing that something had frightened her, asked her what was the matter. There is a nasty frog at the door that lifted my ball for me out of the spring this morning. I told him that he should live with me here, thinking that he could never get out of the spring. But there he is at the door, and he wants to come in. While she was speaking, the frog knocked again at the door and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. Then the king said to the young princess, As you have given your word, you must keep it, so go and let him in. She did so, and the frog hopped into the room, and then straight on, tap, 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 from the bottom of the room to the top, till he came up close to the table where the princess sat. Pray, lift me upon chair, and let me sit next to you. As soon as she had done this, the frog said, Put your plate nearer to me, that I may eat out of it. This she did, and when he had eaten as much as he could, he said, Now I am tired. Carry me upstairs and put me into your bed. And the princess, though very unwilling, took him up in her hand and put him upon the pillow of her own bed, where he slept all night long. As soon as it was light, he jumped up, hopped downstairs, and went out of the house. Now then, thought the princess, at last he is gone, and I shall be troubled with him no more. But she was mistaken, for when night came again, she heard the same tapping at the door, and the frog came once more and said, Open the door, my princess dear, open the door to thy true love here, 
and mind the words that thou and I said by the fountain cool in the greenwood shade. And when the princess opened the door, the frog came in and slept under her pillow as before till the morning broke. And the third night he did the same. But when the princess awoke on the following morning, she was astonished to see, instead of the frog, a handsome prince, gazing on her with the most beautiful eyes she had ever seen, and standing at the head of her bed. He told her that he had been enchanted by a spiteful fairy, who had changed him into a frog, and that he had been fated so to abide till some princess should take him out of the spring, and let him eat from her plate, and sleep under her pillow for three nights. You have broken his cruel charm, and now I have nothing to wish for, but that you should go with me into my father's kingdom, where I will marry you and love you as long as you live. The young princess, you may be sure, was not long in saying yes to all this, and as they spoke a gay coach drove up with eight beautiful horses, decked with plumes of feathers and a golden harness, and behind the coach rode the prince's servant, faithful Heinrich who had bewailed the misfortunes of his dear master during his enchantment so long and so bitterly that his heart had well nigh burst. Then they took leave of the king and got into the coach with eight horses and all set out full of joy and merriment for the prince's kingdom, which they reached safely. And there they lived happily a great many years. End of the short story The Frog Prince by the Grimm Brothers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Puss in Boots by Charles Perrault Once upon a time there was a miller who left no more riches to the three sons he had than his mill, his donkey, and his cat. The division was soon made neither the lawyer nor the attorney was sent for they would soon have eaten up all the poor property the eldest had the mill the second the donkey and the youngest nothing but the cat the youngest as we can understand was quite unhappy at having so poor a share my brothers said he may get their living handsomely enough by joining their stocks together but for my part when i have eaten up my cat and made me a muff of his skin i must die of hunger the cat who heard all this without appearing to take any notice said to him with a grave and serious air do not thus afflict yourself my master you have nothing else to do but to give me a bag and a pair of boots made for me that i may scamper through the brambles and you shall see that you have not so poor a portion in me as you think though the cat's master did not think much of what he said he had seen him play such cunning tricks to catch rats and mice hanging himself by the heels or hiding himself in the meal to make believe he was dead that he did not altogether despair of his helping him in his misery when the cat had what he asked for he booted himself very gallantly and putting his bag about his neck he held the strings of it in his two fore paws and went into a warren where was a great number of rabbits he put bran and so thistle into his bag and stretching out at length as if he were dead he waited for some young rabbits not yet acquainted with the deceits of the world to come and rummage his bag for what he had put into it scarcely was he settled but he had what he wanted a rash and foolish young rabbit jumped into his bag a monsieur puss immediately drawing close the strings took him and killed him at once proud of his prey he went with it to the palace and asked to speak with the king he was shown upstairs into his majesty's apartment and making a low blow to the king he said i have brought you sire a rabbit which my noble lord the master of carabas for that was the title which puss was pleased to give his master has commanded me to present to your majesty from him tell thy master that i thank him and that i am pleased with his gift another time he went and hid himself among some standing corn still holding his bag open and when a brace of partridges ran into it he drew the strings and so caught them both 
he then went and made a present of these to the king as he had done before of the rabbit which he took in the warren the king in like manner received the partridges with great pleasure and ordered his servants to reward him the cat continued for two or three months thus to carry his majesty from time to time some of his master's game one day when he knew that the king was to take the air along the riverside with his daughter the most beautiful princess in the world he said to his master if you will follow my advice your fortune is made you have nothing else to do but go and bathe in the river just at the spot i shall show you and leave the rest to me the marquis of carabas did what the cat advised him to without knowing what could be the use of doing it while he was bathing the king passed by and the cat cried out with all his might help help my lord the marquis of carabas is drowning at this noise the king put his head out of the coach window and seeing the cat who had so often brought him game he commanded his guards to run immediately to the assistance of his lordship the marquis of carabas while they were drawing the poor marquis out of the river the cat came up to the coach and told the king that while his master was bathing there came by some rogues who ran off with his clothes though he had cried out thieves thieves several times as loud as he could the cunning cat had hidden the clothes under a great stone the king immediately commanded the officers of his wardrobe to run and fetch one of his best suits for the lord marquis of carabas the king was extremely polite to him and as the fine clothes he had given him set off his good looks for he was well made and handsome the king's daughter found him very much to her liking and the marquis of carabas had no sooner cast two or three respectful and somewhat tender glances that she fell in love with him to distraction the king would have him come into the coach and take part in the airing the cat overjoyed to see his plan begin to succeed marched on before and meeting with some countrymen who were now mowing a meadow said to them good people you who are mowing if you do not tell the king that the meadow you mow belongs to my lord marquis of carabas you shall be chopped as small as herbs for the pot the king did not fail to ask the mowers to whom the meadow they were mowing belonged to my lord marquis of carabas answered they all together for the cat's threat had made them afraid you have a good property there said the king to the marquis of carabas you see sire said the marquis this is a meadow which never fails to yield a plentiful harvest every year the master cat who went still on before met with some reapers and said to them good people you who are reaping if you do not say that all this corn belongs to the marquis of carabas you shall be chopped as small as herbs for the pot the king who passed by a moment after wished to know to whom belonged all that corn which he then saw to my lord marquis of carabas replied the reapers and the king was very well pleased with it as well as the marquis whom he congratulated thereupon the master cat who went always before said the same thing to all he met and the king was astonished at the vast estates of my lord marquis of carabas monsieur puss came at last to a stately castle the master of which was an ogre the richest ever known for all the lands which the king had then passed through belonged to this castle the cat who had taken care to inform himself who this ogre was and what he could do asked to speak with him saying he would not pass so near his castle without having the honor of paying his respects to him the ogre received him as civilly as an ogre could do and made him sit down i have been assured said the cat that you have the gift of being able to change yourself into all sorts of creatures you have a mind to that you can for example transform yourself into a lion or elephant and the like that is true answered the ogre roughly and to convince you you shall see me now become a lion puss was so terrified at the sight of a lion so near him that he immediately climbed into the gutter not without much trouble and danger because of his boots which were of no use at all to him for walking upon the tiles 
a little while after when puss saw that the ogre had resumed his natural form he came down and owned he had been very much frightened i have moreover been informed said the cat but i know not how to believe it that you have also the power to take on you the shape of the smallest animals for example to change yourself into a rat or a mouse but i must own to you i take this to be impossible impossible cried the ogre you shall see at the same time he changed himself into a mouse and began to run about the floor puss no sooner perceived this than he fell upon him and ate him up meanwhile the king who saw as he passed this fine castle of the ogres had a mind to go into it puss who heard the noise of his majesty's coach coming over the drawbridge ran out and said to the king your majesty is welcome to this castle of my lord marquis of carabas what my lord marquis cried the king and does this castle also belong to you there can be nothing finer than this courtyard and all these stately buildings which surround it let us see the interior if you please the marquis gave his hand to the young princess and followed the king who went first they passed into the great hall where they found a magnificent collation which the ogre had prepared for his friends who were at that very day to visit him but dared not to enter knowing the king was there his majesty charmed with the good qualities of my lord of carabas as was also his daughter who had fallen violently in love with him and seeing the vast estate he possessed said to him it will be owing to yourself only my lord marquis if you are not my son-in-law the marquis with low bows except in the honour which his majesty conferred upon him and forthwith that very same day married the princess puss became a great lord and never ran after mice any more except for his diversion end of the short story puss in boots by charles perrault this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Rumpelstiltskin by the Grimm Brothers By the side of a wood, in a country a long way off, ran a fine stream of water, and upon the stream there stood a mill. The miller's house was close by, and the miller, you must know, had a very beautiful daughter, she was moreover very shrewd and clever and the miller was so proud of her that one day he told the king of the land who used to come and hunt in the wood that his daughter could spin gold out of straw now this king was very fond of money and when he heard the miller's boast his greediness was raised and he sent for the girl to be brought before him then he led her to a chamber in his palace where there was a great heap of straw and gave her a spinning wheel and said all this must be spun into gold before morning as you love your life it was in vain that the poor maiden said that it was only a silly boast of her father for that she could do no such thing as spin straw into gold the chamber door was locked and she was left alone she sat down in one corner of the room and began to bewail her hard fate when on a sudden the door opened, and a droll-looking little man hobbled in and said, Good morrow to you, my good lass. What are you weeping for? Alas, said she, I must spin this straw into gold, and I know not how. What will you give me to do it for you? said the hobgoblin. My necklace, replied the maiden. He took her at her word, and sat himself down at the wheel, and whistled and sang, round about round about lo and behold reel away reel away straw to gold and round about the wheel went merrily and the work was quickly done and the straw was all spun into gold when the king came and saw this he was greatly astonished and pleased but his heart still grew more greedy of gain and he shut up the poor miller's daughter again with the fresh new task 
Then she knew not what to do and sat down once more to weep. But the dwarf soon opened the door and said, What will you give me to do your task? The ring on my finger, said she. So her little friend took the ring and began to work at the wheel again, and whistled and sang, Round about, round about, lo and behold, reel away, reel away, strong to gold. Till long before morning all was done again. The king was greatly delighted to see all this glittering treasure, but he still had not enough. So he took the miller's daughter to yet a larger heap, and said, All this must be spun tonight, and if it is, you shall be my queen. As soon as she was alone, that dwarf came in and said, What will you give me to spin gold for you this third time? I have nothing left, said she. Then say you will give me the first little child that you may have when you are queen, said the little man. That may never be, thought the miller's daughter, and as she knew no other way to get her task done, she said she would do what he asked. Round went the wheel again to the old song, and the mannequin once more spun the heap into gold. The king came in the morning, and finding all he wanted, was forced to keep his word. So he married the miller's daughter, and she really became queen. At the birth of her first little child, she was very glad, and forgot about the dwarf, and what she had said. But one day he came into her room where she was sitting playing with her baby, and put her in mind of it. Then she grieved sorely at her misfortune, and said she would give him all the wealth of the kingdom if he would let her off, but in vain, till at last her tears softened him, and he said, I will give you three days' grace, and if during that time you tell me my name, you shall keep your child. Now the queen lay awake all night, thinking of all the odd names that she had ever heard and she sent messengers all over the land to find out new ones. The next day, the little man came, and she began with Timothy, Ichabod, Benjamin, Jeremiah, and all the names she could remember. But to all and each of them, he said, Madame, that is not my name. The second day, she began with all the comical names she could hear of, Bandy Legs, Hunchback, Crookshanks, and so on. But the little gentleman still said to every one of them, Madame, that is not my name. The third day, one of the messengers came back and said, I have traveled two days without hearing of any other names. But yesterday, as I was climbing a high hill among the trees of the forest where the fox and the hare bid each other good night, I saw a little hut, and before the hut burnt a fire, and round about the fire a funny little dwarf was dancing upon one leg and singing. Merrily the feast I'll make today, I'll brew tomorrow, bake. Merrily I'll dance and sing, for next day will a stranger bring. Little does my lady dream, Rumpelstiltskin is my name. When the queen heard this, she jumped for joy, and as soon as her little friend came, she sat down upon her throne and called all her court round to enjoy the fun, and the nurse stood by her side with the baby in her arms, as if it was quite ready to be given up. Then the little man began to chuckle at the thought of having the poor child to take home with him to his hut in the woods, and he cried out, Now, lady, what is my name? Is it John? asked she. No, madam. Is it Tom? No, madam. Is it Jemmy? It is not. Can your name be Rumpelstiltskin? Some witch told you that! Some witch told you that! cried the little man, and dashed his right foot in a rage so deep into the floor that he was forced to lay hold of it with both hands to pull it out. Then he made the best of his way off, while the nurse laughed and the baby crowed, and all the court jeered at him for having had so much trouble for nothing, and said, We wish you a very good morning and a very merry feast, Mr. Rumpelstiltskin! End of the short story Rumpelstiltskin by the Brothers Grimm This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Twelve Dancing Princesses by the Brothers Grimm There was a king who had twelve beautiful daughters. They slept in twelve beds all in one room. When they went to bed, the doors were shut and locked up. But every morning their shoes were found to be quite worn through as if they had been danced in all night, and yet nobody could find out how it happened or where they had been. Then the king made it known to all the land that if any person could discover the secret and find out where it was that the princesses danced in the night, he should have the one he liked best for his wife, and he should be king after his death. But whoever tried and did not succeed after three days and three nights should be put to death a king's son soon came he was well entertained and in the evening was taken to the chamber next to the one where the princesses lay in their twelve beds there he was to sit and watch where they went to dance and in order that nothing might pass without his hearing it the door of his chamber was left open but the king's son soon fell asleep when he awoke in the morning he found that the princesses had all been dancing for the soles of their shoes were full of holes after him came several others but they had all the same luck and all lost their lives in the same manner now it chanced that an old soldier who had been wounded in battle and could fight no longer passed through the country where this king reigned and as he was traveling through a wood he met an old woman who asked him where he was going I hardly know where I'm going or what I had better do, but I think I should like very well to find out where it is that the princesses dance, and then in time I might be a king. Well, said the old dame, that is no very hard task. Only take care not to drink any of the wine which one of the princesses will bring you in the evening, and as soon as she leaves you, pretend to be fast asleep. Then she gave him a cloak and said, as soon as you put that on, you will become invisible, and you will be able to follow the princesses wherever they go. When the soldier heard all this good news, he determined to try his luck, so he went to the king and said he was willing to undertake the task. He was as well received as the others had been, and the king ordered fine royal robes to be given to him, and when the evening came, he was led to the outer chamber. Just as he was going to lie down, the eldest of the princesses brought him a cup of wine, but the soldier threw it all away secretly, taking care not to drink a drop. Then he laid himself down on his bed, and in a little while began to snore very loud as if he was fast asleep. When the twelve princesses heard this, they laughed heartily, and the eldest said, This fellow too might have done a wiser thing than lose his life in this way. Then they rose up and opened their drawers and boxes and took out all of their fine clothes and dressed themselves at the glass and skipped about as if they were eager to begin dancing. But the youngest said, I don't understand how it is. While you are so happy, I feel very uneasy. I am sure some mischance will befall us. You simpleton, said the eldest. You're always afraid. Have you forgotten how many king's sons have already watched in vain? And as for this soldier, even if I hadn't given him his sleeping drop, he would have slept soundly enough. When they were all ready, they went and looked at the soldier, but he snored on and did not stir hand or foot, so they thought they were quite safe. And the eldest went up to her own bed and clapped her hands, and the bed sank into the floor and a trap door flew open. The soldier saw them going down through the trap door one after another, the eldest leading the way, and thinking he had no time to lose, he jumped up put on the cloak which the old woman had given him and followed them but in the middle of the stairs he trod on the gown of the youngest princess and she cried out to her sisters all is not right someone took hold of my gown you silly creature it is nothing but a nail on the wall then down they all went and at the bottom they found themselves in a most delightful grove of trees and the leaves were all of silver and glittered and sparkled beautifully the soldier wished to take away some token of the place, so he broke off a little branch, and there came a loud noise from the tree. Then the youngest daughter said again, I am sure all is not right. Did you not hear that noise? That never happened before. But the eldest said, 
it is only our princes who are shouting for joy at our approach then they came to another grove of trees where all the leaves were of gold and after to a third where the leaves were all glittering diamonds and the soldier broke a branch from each and every time there was a loud noise which made the youngest sister tremble with fear but the eldest still said it was only the princes who were crying for joy so they went on till they came to a great lake and at the side of the lake there lay twelve little boats with twelve handsome princes in them who seemed to be waiting there for the princesses one of the princesses went into each boat and the soldiers stepped into the same boat with the youngest as they were rowing over the lake the prince who was in the boat with the youngest princess and the soldier said i do not know why it is but though i am rowing with all my might we do not get on so fast as usual and i am quite tired the boat seems very heavy today it is only the heat of the weather said the princess i feel it very warm too on the other side of the lake stood a fine illuminated castle from which came the merry music of horns and trumpets there they all landed and went into the castle and each prince danced with his princess and the soldier who was all the time invincible danced with them too and when any of the princesses had a cup of wine set by her he drank it all up so that when she put the cup to her mouth it was empty at this too the youngest sister was terribly frightened but the eldest always silenced her they danced on till three o'clock in the morning and then all their shoes were worn out so they were obliged to leave off when they came to the stairs the soldier ran before the princesses and laid himself down and as the twelve sisters slowly came up very much tired they heard him snoring on his bed so they said now all is quite safe then they undressed themselves put away their fine clothes pulled off their shoes and went to bed in the morning the soldier said nothing about what had happened but determined to see more of this strange adventure he went again on the second and third night and everything happened just as before the princesses danced each time till their shoes were worn to pieces and then returned home however on the third night the soldier carried away one of the golden cups as a token of where he had been the princes rowed them back again over the lake but this time the soldier placed himself in the boat with the eldest princess and on the opposite shore they took leave of each other and the princesses promised to come again the next night as soon as the time came when he was to declare the secret he was taken before the king with the three branches and the golden cup and the twelve princesses stood listening behind the door to hear what he would say and when the king asked him where do my twelve daughters dance at night he answered with twelve princes in the castle on the ground and then he told the king all that had happened and showed him the three branches and the golden cup which he had brought with him then the king called for the princesses and asked them whether what the soldiers said was true and when they saw that they were discovered and that it was of no use to deny what had happened they confessed it all and the king asked the soldier which of them he would choose for his wife and he answered i am not very young so i will have the eldest and then they were married that very day and the soldier was chosen to be the king's heir end of the short story the twelve dancing princesses by the grimm brothers